I'm going to introduce the first law of thermodynamics and give you a couple of uh, cases where you can apply this. Um, the first law of thermodynamics is an extension of um, conservation of mechanical energy. Um, so we've already spent some time with conservation of mechanical energy. Okay, so conservation of mechanical energy only applies in cases where there are no changes in energy uh, due to thermal effects. And also remember, um, there uh, is no work done by any non-conservative forces. We talked about that a lot. You, uh, <clears throat> you look at the free body diagram and you determine if they're non-conservative forces, are they the types that do zero work? And then that determines whether you can use the equation. Um, so the first law of thermodynamics looks like this. Um, the change in energy, and I'll go into the details about these things, is equal to the heat added to the body plus the work done to the body. Right now, this doesn't look much like conservation of mechanical energy, but I'm going to point out uh, how they relate to each other. Uh, so first of all, what's this E, this total energy? Uh, this energy E is the sum of the potential energy and the kinetic energy, and then something new that I'm going to call the internal energy. Well, I mean, everyone calls it the internal energy. I'm going to denote it with a capital E sub INT. Um, Q is a new thing. Um, this is the energy added to the body or whatever you're uh, isolating, whatever your system, chosen system is. I'll call it a system instead of a body uh, because uh, we're going to see that we're going to do some calculations where the system we're analyzing isn't an object, a skier or whatever. Um, instead, it's a mass of a gas or, you know, it could be a liquid or whatever. Um, w is the work. Uh, and let me reword this. This is the energy. Uh, so, okay, Q is the energy added to the system by heat. W is the energy added to the system uh, by work. And uh, now I'm going to make a distinction here between uh, the work of conservative forces and non-conservative forces. The work done by conservative forces has always been uh, represented to us as a change in potential energy, and we have that here. So this W is just work done by non-conservative forces. So in conservation of mechanical energy, we weren't able to deal with that. Now we are. Conservative forces. Okay, let's define a couple of these things. Um, so first of all, heat. Um, so remember that uh, in order to make sense out of heat, let's think about what work is. Um, work is a change in energy. due to the application of a force. Uh, 
Heat is also a change in energy, but there's a different uh, source for this change in energy. So heat is a change in energy due to a temperature difference. Um, if two bodies are in contact at different temperatures, energy flows from the higher temperature to the lower temperature, and that energy transfer is heat. So in everyday speech, uh, we're used to thinking of heat as related to temperature, like there's a lot of heat outside or whatever. Remember that really what heat is, is a change in energy, energy either being added or removed from the body due to the surroundings and the body having different temperatures. Um, okay, so I am going to uh, now go to an example that we're familiar with and show you how to apply. Oh, There's one more thing that we have to define, and that is the internal energy. Um, and the internal energy is, essentially you can think of this as bigger as the temperature goes up of the object and smaller as the temperature goes down. There's a little more to it than that, but in our examples, uh, that's how it's going to be. So. Um, this is energy that's um, contained by the system. That isn't um, represented by kinetic energy or potential energy. And what that means for us is essentially this is related to the temperature. Um, higher temperature means greater internal energy and lower temperature means uh, lower internal energy. Remember, when we're dealing with conservation of mechanical energy, we're not dealing with any of this temperature-related stuff at all. We didn't have heat. We didn't have internal energy. The other difference is we didn't have a way to represent uh, work done by non-conservative forces. Now we do have a term for that in the equation. Okay, so let's uh, go to a familiar example, a skier on a hill. Um, and, okay, so there's the hill. Let's say that uh, the height of the hill is five meters. There's the skier with his little hat. Um, and let's say that the skier has a mass of 60 kilograms. And let's say that the skier starts at rest and then uh, skis down the hill. Um, and we want to calculate the skier's final speed, the speed at the bottom of the hill. And we're going to do it under a couple of different conditions. Uh, first, the one that we're familiar with is what if there's no friction? And then the second uh, case that we're going to consider is now there is going to be friction. 
and we're going to assume that what this friction does is causes 1,000 joules of heat um, to transfer from the skier to the snow. Uh, let me be explicit about that. So it's transferring from the skier to the snow. So that's going to raise the temperature of the snow that the skier uh, passes through. And um, the temperature of the skis is also going to increase slightly uh, due to this friction. And so we're going to say that that increase in temperature of the skis is an increase in internal energy. And so the skier's internal energy uh, increases 300 joules. Okay, so there's the problem. And the first one uh, is going to be a problem that we can use conservation of mechanical energy for, uh, but I'm going to I'm going to do both of these in the form of the first law of thermodynamics, which is this. Okay, so for part A, well, um, we know because we've done this problem before. Uh, there's no there are no non-conservative forces uh, that do work. The only non-conservative force is the normal force pushing up, and that does zero work on the skier. We're assuming there's no friction. So let's start uh, filling in the values that go into the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, so um, over the interval of this ski, um, you know, going down the hill, what is the change in potential energy? The only potential energy we have is gravitational. Uh, if I make this my height equals zero, um, then the change in potential energy at the later instant, at the bottom of the hill, the potential energy is zero. At the earlier instant, the change is always the later minus the earlier. So at the earlier instant, uh, we have the mass of the skier, 60 kilograms, times 9.8, times a height of 5. And so the change in potential energy, you can see, uh, comes out to be uh, 2,940 joules negative. Okay, that negative is important. And it comes from just the subtraction of the later potential energy minus the earlier. Now what about the kinetic energy? The change in kinetic energy is going to be the kinetic energy at the bottom of the hill. Well, we need the speed for that and we don't know it. So I'm going to write that just as 1 half times 60 times whatever the speed is squared minus the kinetic energy at the top, the person's at rest at the top of the hill, so this is just going to be zero. And so we get a change in kinetic energy of positive 30 V squared. Um, we're doing this in the no friction case, so uh, there is no change in internal energy. That change in internal energy is just due to friction. And so now I guess I'll write that as there's no change in internal energy. And so the total change in energy is the sum of these three. So I'll write that as 30 V squared minus 2940. I'm just adding those up and that's the change in energy. And now uh, what about the heat? and the work done by non-conservative forces. Um, if there's no friction, there's no energy transfer due to temperature difference. 
and so the heat is zero. We've already discussed the fact that there is no work done by non-conservative forces here, and so work is also equal to zero. And now we can plug this into the first law of thermodynamics, and we get, so the first law says 30 V squared minus 2940 is equal to zero. Now we can solve for V and we get that V is equal to plus or minus. We want the positive because, um, because it's a speed uh, and we get a value of 9.90 meters per second. We could have done this in the form of conservation of mechanical energy and we would have gotten the exact same thing. But now we're gonna take the thermal effects of the friction into account. So let's go back and figure out this same stuff that we did in order to fill out the first law. Uh, the potential and kinetic energies are going to be the same. So the change in uh, potential energy is negative 2,940 joules. The change in kinetic energy is 30 V squared, we're still trying to calculate that V. Um, this time there is a change in internal energy. Uh, we said that the skis heat up. As the temperature goes up, internal energy goes up. And so the change in internal energy is 300 joules. Um, Positive means energy in our system increases, so this has to be positive. And now uh, let's think about the heat. Um, we're told that energy transfers out of our system to the snow, to the surroundings, and the total amount is a thousand. Well, our system is losing that thousand joules, so this is negative 1,000. Uh, these signs, come, doing these signs right is really an important key to doing these problems. We're still not dealing with any non-conservative work, um, so that's still zero. And now we'll plug these values into the first law of thermodynamics. So we have the sum of... Uh, these changes in energy, so negative 2940 plus 30 V squared plus 300 is equal to negative 1000 plus zero for the work. Um, and so now I'm just solving for V again. We have 30 V squared is equal to 1640. Solve for V. And this time, well, before I solve it, just think physically about what's happening. Do you expect friction to slow down this skier, make him slower at the bottom of the hill or speed the person up? That would be some crazy kind of friction if it sped the skier up. So we expect this to be smaller than 9.9 .9 for the final speed. And what we get is 7.39 meters per second. So what friction does is it diverts energy that could have been used for the skier's speed to other things. And that makes the kinetic energy and therefore the speed smaller. Now, uh, it's very common to use the first law of thermodynamics, a really useful application of the first law of thermodynamics, is choosing a gas as your system and then uh, calculating uh, these different changes in types of energy in the gas as different processes happen in like industrial applications. And so eventually, here, uh, I'm going to talk about the power cycle and the refrigeration cycle and roughly what happens in those. Um, before I do that, I have to talk about 
uh, some relationships between different properties of a gas. And so I'm going to uh, go into ideal gases. Um, and uh, the, the number one uh, fact about ideal gases is the ideal gas law. And that says that the pressure times the volume of an ideal gas is equal to the number of moles of the gas times the universal gas constant times the temperature. Um, well, ideal gases, even mentioning the term ideal, suggests that there are other types of gases that are not ideal. So what does it mean for something to be an ideal gas? When does this apply? Um, well, it applies in a surprisingly broad number of cases, um, but uh, really it just requires that the pressure doesn't get too high and that the temperature doesn't get too close to absolute zero. So the temperature doesn't get too low, and I'm going to say too close to absolute zero. Um, there are a few things I have to say about these. Uh, First, the pressure. Well, we've talked about a few ways, a couple ways of measuring pressure. Um, we've talked about the true pressure and the gauge pressure. So does it matter which one of those we're using in the ideal gas law? Yes, it's very important. Um, this is the true pressure of the gas. So if you're given a measure in... Um, in gauge pressure, you have to convert it by adding the atmospheric pressure to that value. The volume, there's no, uh, there's no different ways of calculating volume. So I don't have anything to say about that. Um, this lowercase n is the number of moles of the gas. where one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Uh, why are we doing calculations based on dividing gas up into 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules? Why not five molecules or a million molecules or a billion molecules? Um, well, really, for using the um, for using the ideal gas law, it doesn't matter why. That's just that's just how much we're considering to be a unit of gas. But the reason that this is a valuable unit is that uh, if you have this many molecules of a gas, then um, the mass of the gas that you have in grams is equal to the molar mass uh, not, is equal to the um, to the uh, molecular mass of the of the gas molecule, and so that that's why this is a useful number. But for us, you can just think of it as this is the amount of gas that we're talking about. This is the number of molecules we're talking about. Um, R is the universal gas constant. And it is equal to 8.314. And the units are uh, joules over moles times Kelvin. 
Um, okay, uh, as far as the units go, as long as you keep everything in SI units, you can just think of it as 8.314 because the units are a little complicated, but those are what the units are in SI units. And the last definition I have to give you is the temperature. Okay, so um, these uh, units in the universal gas constant uh, suggest that the temperature is going to be in Kelvin. The important thing about Kelvin is that um, the z that zero Kelvin corresponds to absolute zero. And absolute zero is now important w when we're using the ideal gas law. Um, so T is the temperature of the, of the gas in Kelvin. And if you're given the temperature in Celsius, um, the uh, temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in Celsius plus 273. Um, so that's how you can convert back and forth. But one thing that's important to keep in mind is the scale of these two is the same, just what we're calling, what we call zero Celsius and what we call zero Kelvin are different. And so what that means is a temperature change in Kelvin is equivalent to the same temperature change in Celsius. So that's going to come up uh, pretty soon. Okay, so here are all the definitions you need in order to do this, to use uh, the ideal gas law to do calculations. Um, so let's see something like that. Okay, so let's say that we have um, five moles of a gas. Um, in a volume of 0 0.5 cubic meters and at a temperature of, um, uh, let's say, 25 degrees Celsius. And first, let's calculate the pressure uh, the true pressure, and then second, let's calculate the gauge pressure. Okay, um, well, in order to do this calculation, uh, we need to put our temperature in Kelvin. So our Kelvin temperature is 25 plus 273, which is 298 Kelvin. And now we can uh, use the ideal gas law, pressure times the volume is equal to the number of moles. We have everything in SI units, so uh, the universal gas constant is 8.314. times the temperature. And so we get, if you solve for P, a true pressure of 24,775.7 pascals. Well, is this a low pressure or a high pressure compared to the atmospheric pressure we're used to? This is a very low pressure. Um, we're used to 101,000 pascals. So this is really low compared to that. Um, and now if we wanted to give this engaged pressure, we would do that by taking that true pressure and subtracting the atmospheric pressure. And what we get then 
is negative 76,224.3 pascals. Okay, so what the ideal gas law gives you is when you have an ideal gas, you have a relationship between these three properties of a gas, pressure, volume, and temperature. And if you know two of them, you can always calculate the third one. And it doesn't matter which two you know and which one of those three you're trying to calculate. Um, now, there are a couple of other facts about gases, uh, ideal gases, that I need to talk about. Um, and then we'll be able to start talking about the power cycle and the refrigeration cycle. The first one is there's only going to be one type of non-conservative work that we're going to um, deal with, and that's the work of expansion. Um, and so if the gas that's your system expands, um, the work of expansion is positive. So the work of expansion is positive if the gas expands. You can think of gas in a cylinder. Uh, if the gas expands in the cylinder, it pushes the piston up, which does work on the surroundings. Uh, Um, the work of expansion is negative if the gas expands. So the way that works is um, if you imagine the gas that's our system in a cylinder and the gas expands, it pushes a piston up which does work on the surroundings. And so it's adding energy to the surroundings and removing energy from the system. Um, so if the work of expansion is, so if the gas is expanding, it removes energy from the system. And on the other hand, if the work of expansion, you know, the work of expansion is positive if the gas is compressed. So if the volume is reduced, uh, then that has the effect of adding energy to the system. So keep that in mind. That's going to be an important thing that we're going to refer to. And the second thing is the relationship between the internal energy and temperature of an ideal gas. Uh, this is just a pretty simple relationship. Um, and it says that the change in internal energy is equal to the mass of the gas times the constant volume specific heat. I'm just going to call that CV. It's just a constant times the change in temperature. Um, so M is the mass of the gas. Um, CV is, it's not exactly constant, but it stays fairly constant over pretty large changes in temperature. So, uh, We'll call it 724 uh, if the temperature is near 
100 degrees Celsius. And we'll call it 717 if the temperature is near room temperature, so 21 degrees Celsius. That's 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And so with these uh, values, you can uh, you have a relationship between the change in temperature in the gas and the change in internal energy. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here is, remember the ideal gas law, we needed the temperature in Kelvin to do the calculation. Since this is a change in temperature, we can use Kelvin or Celsius temperatures. They are the same. Now, the last thing we need before we can start doing some problems related to power cycles and refrigeration cycles is just to talk about generally what happens in those. And so uh, I'm going to give you a basic description of a power cycle and a refrigeration cycle. Okay, so a power cycle um, is where we use heat transfer in order to do work. Um, that is uh, the basic idea of how power plants work, car engines work. Um, the tool we're using is a change in temperature and the output is work out of the engine. Um, and so we're going to think of a cylinder and a piston. Okay. And this gas here, uh, is going to be our system. And uh, when this piston moves up, that's doing work on the surroundings, that's useful work, that's powering the car, powering the city, whatever. And um, we make that happen by uh, changing the temperature of the gas. So we're going to start by, um, so our first step, is we're going to start with the gas at a regular, uh, relatively small volume. And we're going to heat up the gas. That's supposed to be a fire, you know. And uh, the effect of this is that the gas pressure increases. In step two, now we're going to allow this piston to move. Uh, and let me just elaborate here that for this step, we're going to think of the volume of gas staying constant. Uh, and also, you know, the temp pressure increases, the temperature also increases. Step two. Now we can move the gas away from this flame. And the pressure that we added to this gas causes the piston to rise. Um, and so there's no heat transfer for this step. Um, the volume increases. Um, and work is done on the surroundings. Then uh, we'll have 
a final step three that'll get us back to step one again, and you can just repeat this cycle over and over again. Um, you could also break this up into two different steps, but uh, we're not going to do any calculations related to this, so I'm just going to do it as a single step. But what we do is put this gas in thermal contact uh, with a cold reservoir. Um, heat leaves the gas. Um, the volume decreases. and the temperature decreases. Okay, so that's how a power cycle works. And um, the, the cost of running this power cycle is producing the high temperature and low temperature reservoirs that allow this to keep going around. Um, so let's see what kind of calculation we can do. Um, so let's say that the working fluid in a power cycle, the gas in a power cycle, is air. Well, you wouldn't normally use air. You'd use something that could change phases from liquid to gas uh, easily at the temperatures and pressures you're using. But as a demonstration, air works just fine. Um, so the working fluid is air in a power cycle. Um, and we have a mass of 0 0.3 kilograms in this cylinder. And the question is, if the work done in one cycle has to be 1,000 joules, um, how much does the air temperature have to be raised? Um, okay, well, I'm, this is going to involve steps one and two of this power cycle. So first, we're going to think about step one. Um, well, I'm going to start with step two here because the information we're given is how much work has to be done on the surroundings. And step two is where that work is done. So. Um, in all of these cases, we're going to assume that the height of the gas isn't changing considerably, the kinetic energy isn't changing. And so we're always going to be assuming that the change in energy is just equal to the change in internal energy. Okay, so what happens in step two? Um, we know that the change in internal energy is equal to Q plus W. Um, if you look at what happens in step two, there's no heat transfer. So we know this is equal to, uh, yeah, we know that Q is equal to zero. And we're told that the work done on the surroundings is 1,000 joules. 
Um, so if the work is done on the surroundings of 1,000 joules, that means that the work done on our working fluid is negative 1,000. So we have that the change in internal energy has to be equal to negative 1,000 joules. Um, and so now that we know that our change in internal energy in step two is negative 1,000, we can think about uh, the relationship between internal energy and temperature for an ideal gas. And so we have that negative 1,000 is equal to the mass of the gas times um, the uh, value CV. Um, and I'm going to use the value of 724. That's something that I have to tell you in the problem. Uh, so let's pretend for a second that I had already given you that. Um, So let's imagine that the temperature is up there close to 100 degrees Celsius. Um, delta T. And so uh, delta T is equal to negative 4.60 uh, degrees Celsius. Okay, so for that amount of gas. Uh, we know that in step two, the expansion of the gas loses 4.6 degrees Celsius. And so that means that uh, the temperature increase in step one must be at least 4.6 degrees Celsius. Okay, the other type of important cycle that uh, I'm gonna talk about is the refrigeration cycle. Um, for a refrigeration cycle, uh, the steps are as follows. Um, so again, we're going to think of a piston and a cylinder, and the working fluid is the gas uh, in the underneath the piston, and the steps go sort of like this. Uh, the first step is you use an external force to compress the gas. And so there's no heat transfer here. Um, an external force uh, pushes the piston down. And so the volume decreases and the temperature increases. Uh, now that the temperature is higher, um, step two is the gas is put in thermal contact with the high temperature reservoir, which is the outside, um, and uh, 
since we have increased the temperature in step two, and we've increased it to higher than this high temperature reservoir, we're still able to get energy to leave the gas into the room. So this is like at the back of your refrigerator, this is the coils that are sending out, uh, that are sending energy through heat into the room. Um, so now this is no work is done. Well, um, there's no external force, I should say. Um, but energy leaves the gas to the high temperature reservoir. Um, and as this happens, uh, the volume decreases. Now in step three, um, external work is done um, to allow the gas to expand. Um, and there is no heat transfer. As the volume increases, the temperature decreases. And that temperature decrease needs to go, the temperature of the gas needs to go below the temperature in the cold reservoir where you keep your popsicles and vegetables and stuff. And then in step four, uh, the gas is put in thermal contact with the cold reservoir. And um, because we've made the temperature of the gas lower than the cold reservoir, heat goes from the cold temperature to the gas. Um, and so in this case, uh, heat transfers from the cold temperature to the gas. And so by compressing the gas and then allowing the gas to expand, we can make the same gas a higher temperature than the outside environment that we don't care about in order to eject energy. And then later, we can get the gas colder than the cold temperature environment, um, and that will pull energy out of the place that we're trying to get cold. Um, as an example problem, and as the problems that you're gonna do, again, I'm gonna use air as the working fluid, but that's not what you would normally use. Again, you would use phase change to make this much more efficient, um, and that's what refrigerants do, uh, but you can, you can understand the idea of this by thinking about calculations involving air. So let's do an example problem. Uh, so this time let's think of a refrigeration cycle. Um, and we're gonna think of air that's initially 
at 15 degrees Celsius. Um, and so we're going to use a CV value of 717. And uh, so the first question is, how much work has to be done on 0.1 kilograms of air to um, get the temperature of the air to 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, and the reason that you do this is because, for example, you could imagine that the air outside behind the coils of the refrigerator, the air in the room is say 21 degrees Celsius. And so now you have a higher temperature gas that can eject energy into the surroundings. And then the second question is, um, how much work has to be done by the air um, to get the temperature from, let's say that it starts this step at 25 degrees Celsius uh, and we want to get it down to 10 degrees Celsius in order to extract energy from the refrigerator region, the cool region, the region that we're trying to get cool. Okay, so for part A, um, we want the change in internal energy. We want to calculate the change in internal energy uh, that's required for a temperature increase of 15 degrees Celsius. So the mass is 0.1. Uh, we are using a C value of 717. And we want a temperature increase of 15 degrees Celsius. And so we get 1,075.5 joules. Okay, well, the first law says that the change in internal energy is equal to uh, the heat transfer plus the work. Um, in this step, uh, uh, there is no there is no heat transfer, there's only work. And so this is gone, and that says that the work that has to be done is 1,075.5 joules. Now there's a similar calculation in order to calculate part B. If we want to reduce the temperature from 25 degrees Celsius down to 10 degrees Celsius, The change in internal energy is the mass times 717. Uh, now we have a decrease of 15 degrees Celsius. So this is going to be negative 15. Uh, and in this case, you get the exact opposite value, negative 1,075.5. And so the first law of thermodynamics says negative 1075.5 is equal to Q plus W. There's no heat transfer in this part. And so the work is equal to negative 1075.5 joules. Since that's negative, we know that that's energy being removed from the working fluid from our system. And so that's how much work 
our system has to do on the surroundings to reduce the temperature that much. Um, in the problems that I'm asking you to do, uh, you're going to follow steps just very similar to this. So uh, be sure you're, you're following what's happening in these example problems.